Hi guys, once again it's your boy Brainiac327 here, and um, I'm here to solve an interesting problem. So, we've had a lot of relatively new players join the server lately, lately, which is great, glad to have you. And a problem that a lot of you guys seem to run into is you don't know what a lot of the cards do. I've been seeing a lot of questions of, are there any cards that do this, are there any, are there any cards that do that? Now. Lackey does have a function that allows you to do this. Do this. It is convenient in some ways. Let me provide you an example of how it can be a little bit insufficient or incomplete. This video is going to be all about cards that generate value in some way and cards that put other cards in your hand. So let's say I wanted card draws. So I would search skill contains draw. Already you see a problem where I have to separate it based on skill one, skill two, skill three. When I click on this and I search up skill one contains draw, I come upon 130 cards. This, not all of these cards are particularly good at adding cards to your hand. Some of these are a raw draw discard. For example, loot is a raw draw discard. That might not be what you want. Some of these cards are on hit, some of them are not, and some of the cards are just straight up bad. And that's what this video is here for. This video is here to separate the good cards from the bad cards. So I will be going over 89 different cards. So hopefully this video doesn't take too long. Um, these cards will all do a variety of different things, and hopefully I go over them pretty quickly. The first set of cards I'm going to be over are cards that just give you relatively efficient draws in one way or another. Most of these are going to be one for one draws. Uh, flip one bond, rule of thumb, flip one bond for one card draws are the most efficient draws that you could possibly go for when putting a card in the deck. So these first few cards I will be going over are variations of that. The first card I'll be going over simply for thematic purposes is Marth. This card isn't amazing. It's not an amazing card. What it does in terms of card draws is, at the end of your turn, if you have more units on your board than your opponent does, you draw a card for free. No strings attached. No strings attached. You just draw a card. Card. It's a free card, which is pretty good, but at the same time, one, the card itself doesn't do much aside from sit there and hopefully draw you a card. And for another thing, you also need to already have a board presence, which so it requires effort on your end in order to make the card useful in the first place. It's a decent card to slip in a deck with red in it if you need something to just put in there, but it's not an amazing card. It's still a passable card, though, so you could do that. Next card I'm going to go over, Nino. Nino. Uh, Nino's actually going to show up twice in this video. Uh... The first function that I'm going to go over is her second skill here. Um, if Nino is on the board and another ally is supported by Nino, you can flip one to draw a card. So it is a one for one. Um, since you will be running this card in purple, you can stack Ninos on top of the deck using other skills in order to make this skill activate. This skill is also convenient in the sense that it activates on the opponent's turn if you support a Nino and Nino is still on the board which can really come in clutch sometimes because it can draw you an evade or it can draw you something that you can deploy next turn. So it's pretty good. And its first skill is also pretty good, but I will go over that when the time comes. It's a decent card, uh, but there will be better cards in this video, even within purple. Uh, Nino is definitely not a staple in purple, but just like Marv, she's a card you can put in your deck if you need to take up space. Next card I will go over is Tine. Tine is a very easy card to run in... A deck. In order for Tina to work, you do not need to run a lot of yellow in your deck. She is unique in that aspect. Because her draw actually comes from her bond skill. Her bond skill is, as soon as you place this card in your bonds, you can flip a bond face down to draw a card, including this card. This card. So you can run Tina in a lot of decks that otherwise want nothing to do with yellow. The most famous example is uh, Mamui, well, male corn before set 17 rolled around anyway. Male Corn is a good example of a deck that would run Tine, and that would be the only yellow bond bond card that that deck would ever run. 
run. So if you really need something, anything in your deck that draws you cards, you can just kind of put 14A in there, and it'll do the job that you want it to do. It will take up space in your deck, take up space in your deck, but it probably won't be a dead draw because you can just bond a draw card. So it's not a bad addition to most decks. It's not a bad addition. Like, at all. Next card I'll be going over is Liana. Is Liana. Liana is a very niche card. Uh, now I think about it, I probably shouldn't have put her in this early in the video. This is a section that would work out better. But how? what this card does is, when you destroy an enemy via a skill, uh, I'll be going over cards that do that in the next video of this kind that I make that I make. Her third skill says, when you use a skill to destroy an enemy, you can flip one to draw a card. Which, again, is a pretty efficient rate of drawing a card, but it's obviously pretty restrictive in how often you can do it. How many skills can you possibly use per turn that blow up something on the enemy side of the screen? Not very frequently per turn, but it is still pretty high value. I can think of a number of situations where I might run it. Might run it. That is, uh, it has the advantage of being efficient, it also has the advantage of being colorless. Because it means that you can run it in anything, like, not, like, not functionally run in everything. You're obviously not going to run it in any and everything, but theoretically you could run it in anything that you want, and it's not going to take up a lot of bond space, it's not going to restrict what you can put in your deck, because putting a colorless card in your deck requires no commitment in terms of what else you put in your deck. If you were to put a red card in your deck, you have to commit yourself to running red cards now, otherwise you'll never be able to deploy it. Let's say I wanted to run Marf in this deck, I'll pull Marf back out. If I wanted to put Marf in a deck for whatever reason and I'm not already running red, I now most of the time have to commit myself to running more red cards because otherwise, unless I literally draw two of these things, I'm never going to get to deploy it or use it ever. Ever. That's why I say that Tina is an exception, because she draws you a card the moment you put her in the bond zone. And if you flip her, if she's the card you put face down, the fact that she's not contributing to a bond call you actually need doesn't matter, since you're flipping her down anyway. Um, anyway, Liana has that exact same strength, just manifested in a different way, where you don't have to commit yourself to running a whole color in order to make this card work. Uh, other than that, it's an alright card, but it's not a super amazing card by any stretch of imagination. Next card that I will go over is Loot. The main draw behind Loot is her support skill. Again, this is another card that you are going to be running in purple the vast majority of the time. Of the time. You flip a purple bond when this thing comes up as your attack support. See here it says attack support support. When it comes up, you may flip a purple bond face down to draw a card. So it is, yet again, a one for one. You're going to notice a theme with the cards I include in this video, is that the vast majority of them are one for ones. You are going to be running it in purple, but it is actually a pretty good card to run in purple. If you're running generic purple, which is basically 50 purple cards, you are going to put this card in your deck, I'd say, about half of the time. It is a pretty good card. It's actually going to show up twice in this video. Twice in this video. Um, but the support skill is the first skill. You can stack it with a number of different cards that I will probably be going over in a different video. Video, or you can just randomly mill it at any point during the game. You can just randomly proc it, and it's always convenient when it pops up. So it is a pretty very good card to put in any purple deck. I wouldn't run it in a deck that's not running a lot of purple though. This isn't the type of card that I would run purple specifically so I can use this card. Use this card. But it's a pretty good card for a purple deck. Next up is Arvis. Arvis is a completely new card. Uh, he is a set 17 card, and I'd say this card is best- it's going to show up in the next video, by the way, as well. This card is best in decks that that ramp pretty quickly. Um, 
you will notice, for those of you that watched the first video that I uploaded, where I just played casual matches against Shadow Pills, uh, shout out to my boy Pills, by the way, wait, that I ran this card in that deck, because, in the deck that I ran, because the deck that I ran ran ramps pretty hard. And the draw skill that this card has is at six bonds, you can flip one to draw a card. It is once per turn. It is not the most impactful of skills, but none of these one-for-one -one draw are the, most, are the most impactful of skills. It's just really efficient. That's all it is. It's just really efficient. And if you're running yellow, yellow doesn't really have a lot in the way of direct value. Um, other than this card, the only other card in yellow that gives you direct value in terms of cards in your hand is Team A. If Team A is not enough, you might want to consider running this thing if you have faith that you can bond Excel quickly. Well, it's a pretty good card. It has another skill, I'll just briefly go over it. It's a flip one to destroy something if you have eight bonds, which is a very tall order. But if you're ramping super hard, it's not that tall of an order. I'll go over it. I'll talk more about that in the next video. Next video. Next card is... Oh, it's this time already. Okay, so... Now we have to talk about Obero. Now we have to talk about Obero. If you are running white... If you are running white, if you are running a substantial amount of white in your deck, you are going to be running this card. This card is... Well, not this card. These two cards are broken. They're absolutely broken. But first I have to explain how Obero works, because a lot of new players actually don't know how this interaction happens. So, nothing in Obero 4's, t 4's skill set directly insinuates that you're drawing a lot of cards with it. Like, nothing in this skill set tells you to draw a card. But, when you move Obero, for the cost of one white bond, you can class change any Obero with this card. You may class change any Obero with this card. And class changing draws you a card. Normally, yeah. Free card. This cost one here can just move for free if she's untapped. If she's untapped. So here's how this interaction works works. Let's imagine that there are four white bonds over here. Just picture it in your mind there are four white bonds over here. I have this Obro in my front line. I use Hoshiden Naginata Arts. Arts. I move the unit for free. I activate Glamorous Quick Change Princess. I flip the white bond. I class change the Obro. I draw a card for that. Then I use her second skill, her class change skill, Makeup Fix, which is send the topmost card of this unit stack to the retreat area. Which means I take this promo and I cast it right back off. Back off. Because of a quirk in this game's rules, when I class change onto this card and then remove that card from the stack, this once per turn condition is reset and I can use the skill again. Which means I can now move Obero again, class change again, flip another bond, draw another card, and I can keep doing that for every single white bond that I have. Which means, if I'm, if you are running a substantial amount of white, and you have a cost 4 Obero in the retreat, you can deploy cost 1 Obero, flip as many white bonds as you want to draw a corresponding amount of cards. Not only is it efficient, it's one for one, but unlike literally every other card that I've gone over so far, there isn't really a limit on how frequently you can do this per turn, other than the amount of bonds you have. The closest to it being limitless is Liana, but again, how often are you going to meet the condition to activate this skill? And everything else is once per turn. Is once per turn, so it's efficient, but you can't get all the cards at once cards at once. So, yeah, this is broken. Other than that, there's also the fact that the fact that it's a really good tempo card, but I will go over that probably two videos from now. Now, it's also a base 80 potentially, but again, I'll go over that two videos from now. But for the sake of 
adding a lot of cards to your hand, just know that if you are running a lot of white, this is the card to go to. White technically has other things that draw it cards, but generally this is the one to go to. One to go to. Next card. Sophia. Sophia draws you cards. Sophia is more of a counterpick tech option if you're looking for value. You even if you're not counterpicking something, it's a decent card just because it stacks for the price of one bond. But other than that, for sake of putting cards in your hand, you are mostly looking at Legendary Weapon Apocalypse, where you reveal the top card of your opponent's deck, set it to the bonus area, and if the revealed card was a Tome card, you draw a card. So if you are fighting Kanas, May, Makaya, or any other deck that would otherwise run a lot of Tome units, units, you basically just flip two bonds to draw two cards, and as the added bonus, if you use the skill twice, it's not once per turn, or even twice per turn, by the way. Wait, you could literally deploy it, flip every single bond, and draw a lot of cards if you really want to. Want to. It's a very abusive skill. <laughs> it is a very abusive skill. Obvious, like, not obvious, um, arguably even worse than overall in this aspect, if you are up against a Tome deck. And you have the added bonus of if you activate the skill twice, you can flip one of your opponent's bonds face down. So assuming that your opponent is also running efficient efficient on um, drawing cards, you essentially get a 2 for 3 where you flip two cards, you flip two bonds, draw two cards, and deny your opponent a potential card. So in a Tome matchup, it's also really good. There are also decks that aren't 100% Tomes, but run a lot of Tomes. Tiki is a deck that runs a lot of Tomes, runs a lot of Tomes. Saber is a deck that runs a lot of Tomes. Most, a lot of green decks run a lot of Tomes, and a lot of purple decks run a lot of Tomes. So Sophia, if you flip two, will probably draw you at least one card in those matchups, but it's not guaranteed. Guaranteed, it's a lot more variable in those matchups, and it's a lot of RNG. So it's not that reliable in most matchups, but in some matchups it can be very abusive, which is why I mentioned it here. Mention it here. Uh, Femily. Incredibly niche, ridiculously niche. Frankly, the only reason why I even mention it here is because black is such a bad color that I think this is really the only good draw option it has, and it's not even that good. Basically, uh, at the end of your turn, if your opponent doesn't really have a field at all, if there are no non-main character enemies, you get to flip one to draw a card. It's efficient, but that's if you manage to make sure your opponent doesn't have anything on their side of the screen. It's not always, it's not something you can do consistently at all. Yeah, it's not something you can do consistently at all at all. The only reason I mention it is because if you're hell-bent on running black for some reason, it's really the only draw option you have. I'm, I'm not exaggerating at all. It is the only draw option you have if you're trying to run a lot of black. Can I mention it? Because there was a newer player the other day who wanted to run a mono black deck. deck, and this was the only draw card that could possibly go in that deck if it was to be mono black, which is why I mention it here. Mention it here. Uh, next card is Lena. Incredibly niche card. Incredibly niche card. The only deck I would ever run this card in is Hector, and I would barely even run it there. It's a fairly helpful card for MCs that have to discard copies of themselves for their skills. So you could run it in May. You could run it in Hector. Uh, you could run it in Soren. Emphasis on could. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If you want to, you can. It won't be bad. It will not be a bad card in those decks. I can promise that much. There are better cards that you can use that I will go over, but... Go over, but this card can work in those decks, which is why I feel I need to mention it. Need to mention it, if only very briefly. Alrighty, now, uh, I mentioned that Corrin is the only black uh, drawing option. I know Arede is black, but she does not help black. What Arede does is, uh, you tap this unit, you reveal the top card of your deck, well, you draw a card and reveal it. If it is white, you get to keep it for free. If it's not white, 
then you have to discard a card from your hand. So if the card is white, you get a draw, and if the card is not white, you get to cycle your hand, which is still decent, but it's not worth it if the card isn't white. Because white cards happen, because white happens to have this black-white mechanic, it means that you can run a white MC. You can run a white MC, run a lot of black and white cards, black and white cards, so you don't have to commit too hard to running black. What's, you don't have to commit too hard to running black in order to use this card, because you can just run a bunch of black and white cards in your deck, bond one of them, have the one card count towards your MC's color, and black, and black, and then just play this, and since every other card in your deck is white, you will draw a card nearly 100% of the time. At a time. So it is a black card that is good in white decks. Think about that for what you will. Basically, if your deck is entirely white and you run a bunch of black-white cards, it is a tap this unit to draw a card, and 8% of the time, you get a mage emblem and you get to cycle your hand. hand. Next card is, oh, it's about that tile already. So, perfect time to actually go over cycling hand, because now we are going to talk about cycling your hand. So. First honorable mention here goes to Loot's first skill. I mentioned she would be showing up a second time. In this video, this is the second time she's showing up. Her first skill allows you to mill out, to cycle through your hand. You pick cards in your hand that you do not want, that are not monster cards. You discard them, and you draw that amount of cards. If you discard three, you draw three. So you can discard three cards that you do not want in your hand, that serve no purpose in your hand, that are not helpful to the situation. You discard them, and you draw three cards that might be more helpful, might be more needed in the situation. And as an added bonus, she buffs herself. Buffs herself. Now, why is this only an honorable mention? Because there's a very simple way of doing that, and it's called Mage Emblem. Age Emblem. It's also called Courage Emblem. These are two different support skills that are incredibly common in this game. I believe every single color has at least one Mage Emblem support skill. Support skill. If you want to know what cards have Mage Emblem support skills, you could either think about all the Fire Emblem characters that are Anima Mages, and just look them up, and they'll probably have a cost one. Or you can search here skill for contains magic emblem, and you will see every magic emblem in the game, every single one. Every single one without fail. One without fail. The only color that does not have magic emblem is black. Go figure. It's black. Go figure. Magic emblem is incredibly useful support skill for the reason I just mentioned. If you have a card in your hand that doesn't do anything, thing, and you mill this support while you're attacking, you draw a card you draw a card and you choose a card that you do not want and put it in the retreat area. If you have a garbage card in your hand, you just toss that and replace it with the card that you just drew. If you like everything that you have in your hand, and you don't want the new one, you can just toss the new one. So although the support skill is technically mandatory, it doesn't have to have an impact on what's in your hand, so it doesn't really matter. Really matter in that setting. So it is pretty useful. I wouldn't build a I wouldn't build a whole deck around it. For obvious I would I wouldn't build a whole deck around it, but it's very useful to put in the deck. For the sake of keeping your hand in a state that you would like it to be in. Like it to be in. Um, the other support skill is Courage Emblem, or Fate Emblem. Emblem, uh, these go by a lot of different names and a lot of different colors, but I'm pretty sure most colors have them. 
There might be a couple that don't have them, but most colors in the game have a Fate Emblem, a Courage Emblem, or I believe some of them are called Strategy Emblem. So if you go into Skill 4 and you search up Fate Emblem, you will run into every card that has a Fate Emblem. A Fate Emblem. And already, you're seeing basically every color. If you look up Courage Emblem, you will see the three cards that have that. I believe Strategy Emblem is something different, actually. Oh, Strategy Emblem doesn't even exist. Okay, ignore that. Uh, <laughs> okay, ignore that. But if you look up Fate Emblem, you will run into pretty much every, every one of these support skills. Which is, instead of draw a card, discard a card, it is draw a card, place a card from your hand on top of the deck. Which not only serves the same purpose of getting rid of cards in your hand that you don't want or need, but it also prevents you from getting bad supports as you attack, as you continue attacking that turn. Turn, which in an RNG infested mess like this game, it's actually pretty convenient. Convenient to be able to do that. Again, I wouldn't cram your deck with more than maybe 12 of these, if even 12 of these. If even 12 of these, most of the time, I wouldn't consider it by itself. It's a pretty convenient support skill nonetheless. It's pretty good. Um, there are different reasons to go for Mage Emblem or a Strategy Emblem. Mage Emblem or a Strategy Emblem. Uh, Mage Emblem can take cards that you want in the retreat and puts them in the retreat immediately. Immediately. It's also not color restrictive. So, so if my MC is white and I proc May 1, I can still activate Magic Emblem. Courage Emblem saves you from bad supports, or it saves you from at least one bad support, but it's color restrictive. Your attacking unit has to match the color of the supporting card in order for Fate Emblem to activate. So it is definitely color restrictive. If you're running mono color, you'd probably rather have a Fate Emblem. Um, but Magic Emblem is also convenient in those cases. For example, if you are playing a deck with Lil Bronit. Now, what a convenient time to have May here. Because I believe the next card is... Yep. Alright, this, this, this was inevitable. <laughs> this part was inevitable. Time to talk about the most broken cards in the entire game. So, starting with these two cards, I'm not... I'm now going to transition into what I like to call the burst options. These are the cards that you run in very aggressive decks. Aggressive decks that aren't necessarily value oriented. Oriented, but they oriented. But they burn their hands pretty quickly and they will still need cards like these to keep their hand to a relatively usable workable state. State and the Paragon of this, the finest example of this is May. Both of them. So, in terms of draw skills, what do they do? Well, they do. May, cost four May, can flip one bond to buff all of her allies by ten, and if your hand size is three or lower, you draw a card from this. So, if you have less than four cards in your hand, you draw a card for using this skill. So it is a one for it is still a one for one that buffs herself and any other tome allies on the screen. On the screen. So if your hand size is low, if you're if you are running an aggressive tome heavy deck with a small hand size, it is already better it is already better and more efficient than the vast majority of vast majority of cards that I have talked about in the past however many minutes I spent talking about this. this. On top of that, she has Seraphim, which I will go over in the next video. video. But using Seraphim actually enables you to get to the point where you have three or fewer cards in your hand much more easily. Easily. So, the t so her two skills actually work together. On this, the card is broken. Ever since set nine, the card's been broken. This card 
by itself carries entire MCs to victory. Victory. Maybe not a hard carry in some cases, but she definitely carries MCs like Micaiah, Kana, Soren. Kana, Soren. Um. To the upper echelons of the tier list. Tier list. Uh, then we have this thing. This thing from set 16. This card is also broken, mostly because of Meyer. <laughs> mostly because of Meyer, but I'll I'll go over that more in the next video. Hopefully I spend next hopefully in the next video I spend more time on each card. Card. In this video I'm more so talking about Prayer to the God of Yore. If you have two or fewer cards in your hand, you draw a card. Or flipping a bond. A bond. Unlike most of the other draw skills, it's not once per turn. Turn. If you can keep yourself at two cards or less, you can just keep flipping bonds and drawing cards. So let's say you are playing a crit spamming deck. For example, let's say that you are playing... Let's pull up an example deck here. Let's say we are pulling up... I swear to God. Let's say we are pulling up Kaze. Kaze. I believe... This is the wrong Kaze deck. Kaze deck. Jared suggested to me one time, when I was proxying Kaze, that I run May in Kaze. Kaze, for this exact reason. reason. Kaze is an example of a deck, well, of the deck, that just throws his cards away for the sake of offensive pressure. To pressure. He is going to be critting all of the time. All of the time. Which means his hand is going to be low all of the time. Time, which is a perfect time for me to come in and start flipping bonds. Bonds. If I crit enough to get my hand to two cards, I can flip one to draw a card. Then if I crit again, I can flip a card bond again to draw another card, and I can keep going for the rest of my turn so long as I have bonds. Bonds. In hyper aggressive decks, in low hand decks, it is a very ridiculous card. Ridiculous card. I would argue that I would argue that 16 May splash I would argue that May as a collection of cards is the most broken collection of cards in the entire game. That is my argument. Wait, for like the impact it makes to the meta to the meta and for how just oppressive the cards are in combination, they're just oh my, oh my god. Speaking of potentially oh wait, bad timing. Okay, uh so I guess I have to talk about this card now. Uh, you don't really have a particularly compelling reason to run this card if you are running May, but it exists. It exists. If you have a very low hand count, you can flip a lot of bonds at once to draw a lot of cards at once. It's not worth it unless you have unless you literally have one card in hand. If you literally have one card in hand, then it's technically worth it. And it's technically worth it because you just got four one for ones at once. Once, which I'd say is pretty good. If you have zero cards in hand, then you got a then you got a one for one and a free. Then you got four one for ones and a free card, which is also pretty good. Uh, but it's a lot less flexible than just having four one for ones, like overclass make and potentially have. Actually have, and you also need to have a ridiculously low hand count for it to be valued. If you are running May and you have three cards in hand, cards in hand, you get good value while you have three cards in hand. If you are running this card, this card you need to have one card in hand for it to be good value. Value. It's still a decent card, I just wouldn't run it. It's a decent card if you want to run it, but I personally wouldn't run anything. Most of the time, I would just run May. May. It's also worth noting that Alphonse has a new card that basically does this. So take everything I say about this card and apply it to that card as well. The only difference is the actual numbers in terms of bonds and draws is are different. But other than that, apply everything I said about this card to that card as well. Well, uh, Lachesis is a pretty much used in Eldigan and that's about it. 
it's pretty much using Eld again, and that's about it. And I only know one person who plays Eld again. Shout, shout outs to Brave Saint Cypher. Cypher. It's another card that is good if your hand count is low. It also has that same convenient advantage of not needing to commit yourself to running yellow in order to put this card in your deck. All you have to do is place it in your bond zone when you have a low hand count and you draw a card for free. Card for free. If you're not running yellow, that's all it's gonna do. If you are running yellow, it's good in very aggressive builds. Uh, again, like Eldi. Okay. I believe back when Sirius MC existed, Alacrium ran this in Sirius, and it also worked out. But those are the only two scenarios where I've seen this card be used at all. At all. I still think it earns a mention here for being very good, very high value in specific decks. But a lot of time, you do have better options than this card. I will say that much. That much. Like, for example, if your deck is already running red, just use May. It's May. I'm going to sound like a broken record by the end of this video, but half of the time, you should probably just use May. Excuse me. The next card I'm going to be talking about is Iliana. Uh, speaking of really good cards, cards, this card can actually compete with May if you're running green, or if you decide that green has a better collection of cards than red does, this card can serve as a decent substitute for May, because if I pull this back out, this card and May do a lot of the same things. They just do it differently. Differently. Both of them can cheaply and efficiently destroy units on the other side of the screen. Screen, and they both can burst draw you cards if your hand is low. They just do it differently. May is less committal on both of her skills. Her skills, but if you are running green, Iliana is still an incredibly good card. Card. So in terms of her card draws, what she does is, if your hand is low, you can flip two bonds to draw two cards, if you have four or fewer cards in your hand. So any deck that you decide to splash green in, that could potentially dip to a low hand size, you can flip two, draw two cards. Any green MC will probably be running this card for that exact reason. When your hand gets low, you just flip two, draw two cards. Cards. Flip two isn't that committal. It's pretty committal. It's not exactly a spammable skill. Skill, but it's still fairly flexible. But it's still fairly flexible. It depends on the MC. For example, if you're playing Sonicy, you can probably use if you're playing Sonicy and you decide to run this card, you could probably use the skill once or twice and that's it. That's it. If you're playing Micaiah and you're flipping a bond every turn, you can probably use the skill once and that's it. And that's it. But if you're playing something like the new Soren and your MC specifically isn't flipping any bonds for anything, you could probably use this skill several times and have it work out. Work out. So it's a really good skill. Um, it's a really good... This is a really good card in general. General. If you are running green, and that green isn't Sigrun, and Sigrun or Flyers, I would probably put this card in there, not just for the second skill, but the first skill as well, which I'll go over in the next video. In the next video. Matthew! Okay, so... Another support skill. The most trend with purple is that most of purple's value comes from its support skills. Matthew is a very good card in purple decks that like to drain their hand, and if you are running generic purple, and you are relying on Manicat emblems, that is a lot of them. So what this card does is, if you have less cards in your hand than your opponent, so not less than 5, not less than 4, not 1 card, not 0. Simply, if you have less cards than your opponent, you can draw a card for free, if you mill this as your attack support skill, as your attack support. You can then start flipping bonds to activate the skill again. Let's say you have 5 open bonds, your opponent has 
seven cards in hand, you have one card in hand, you prop this, either on purpose or by accident, flip five bonds and draw six cards. It is a potentially Okay, I'm glad that child decided to stop screaming. It is a very it is a potentially very potent way of adding a lot of cards to your hand from on top of your deck. Your deck in one move. One move. But you have to have been burning cards much faster than your opponent in order for that to work out. Work out. This is the type of card that I would probably run two to three of in most purple decks, if not any purple deck. Purple deck. It does have the caveat of being a 10 support. 10 support, but so long as it's the only 10 support, I think it's worth running. Running, as it's only going to mess you up on occasion. It can still mess you up when you're attacking, but it'll only mess you up on occasion. Occasion. And then we go over actually a new set of cards. Cards. So you'll notice I have these cards broken up into categories. Into categories. This next category of cards are cards that require some kind of offensive pressure on your end in order to make the most out of these cards. Cards. I'll start with the cards that are easier to get value with. With, and the first cards I have on this list are the ninjas. One is relatively old, and one is relatively new. Kagro and Kaze. They both do about the same thing, and they both do slightly different things. So, what Kagro does is, what Kagro does is, when another dagger ally crits, you draw a card. This is not once per turn. Ka it does not activate if Kagro herself crits, but if any other dagger unit on the screen crits, she draws a card for free. So you toss a card to draw a card, draw a card, and tossing the card allows you to hit a larger opponent with much smaller units. Much, much smaller units. It doesn't exactly generate value per se. Well, it kind of generates value, but it doesn't stockpile value the way a lot of the previous cards stockpile value. value. What this card enables you to do is it enables you to maintain a potent offense without just running out of cards. It allows you to spam crits on your opponent constantly without running out of cards. Cards. That's what this card enables you to do. You do. Kaze is similar, but his is once per... Kaze is similar with some differences. One, it's once per turn. Two, it's any ally's critical hit. And two, it has to actually hit and destroy the enemy destroy the enemy. So it is a lot more restrictive than Kagro's skill, while also loosening up on some of the restrictions. I will say that Kaze and Kagro have near-perfect synergy. Synergy. Because Kaze allows any unit, let alone any dagger unit, any unit to crit with any one-cost unit in your hand. So, for example, you can have Kaze, Saizo, Asugi, or literally any other dagger unit you could possibly have in your deck, crit with any cost one you have in your deck, be it a cost one you might want or a cost one you might not want, and Kagro, Kagro will still draw a card for that, and if that ally destroys the thing it's critting, you actually just discarded one card in order to draw two cards. Draw two cards by proccing Kagro's skill and also proccing Kaze's skill at the same time. So it is a very good deck. If you are running these cards, you probably want to run the full ninja build. What the full ninja build looks like is... The full ninja build generally looks like is... Ignoring the red that's in this deck, Saizo, Obero... Did I say Saizo? Well, Saizo, Obero, Kaze, and Kagero in roughly these numbers. You also might want a Sugi. 
You also might want this Asugi in your deck because it is decent. It's alright. Sometimes I admit it, but it's a pretty good option in the deck as well. You need to commit yourself to running the ninja package in order to make these cards work, but if you can run the full ninja package from something, it's very, it's incredibly potent. You, you can run. That's why a lot of the that's why a lot of the admins, a lot of the most successful players on the server right now are saying that Ninja, or at the very least Coco Show, maybe not a lot of them, the very least Coco Show is saying, saying that Ninja Corn, nin, male Corn with Ninjas is probably the best deck in the format right now for that exact, because of how potent the combination of Kaze and Kagura is, or even just how potent either of them are by themselves. So can make that deck the strongest deck in the format. Or at the very least, contribute to it being the strongest deck in the format. Second the format. Uh, Marth is a rotated card. I don't recall if it's the first card that is rotated out that's going to show up in this video. But, uh, yeah, I'm showing the rotated cards too in this video. In this video, because some players will be playing it, will probably be playing it unlimited, so I feel like showing these cards also. It's a good idea. Um, if you attack your opponent, and this with this card and this card support is two cards lower, you add it to your hand for free. It is a free card, but it's a luck-based free card. Free card. So for decks that run a lot of low-cost wins, uh, for example, if you are running Tiki or Naoi and you have a lot of cost one, cost two mana cats, this card can be pretty decent in that. In that, if you run if you run a lot of low-cost flies, this card can be pretty decent for that as well as well. Um, if you are running a lot of low-cost tome units in a deck like Mayor Kanas, this card can work in that as well. That as well. Um, you can rig the card that you want to draw, or you can just randomly swing and randomly get a free card. card. It's not an impactful card. If you plop it down, it's not going to change the game at all. It's just going to give you a free card your free card so it can be a filler option that's what i call it i call this a filler option for a lot of different decks but it is fairly rng dependent and also bear in mind it is set four it is a set four card which means it is rotated out if you are playing a standard format you cannot play this card card hopefully i remember to mention whenever a card is rotated out if i fail to mention whenever a card is rotated out uh, just look at the set number. If it says 1, 2, 3, or 4, it's probably rotated out. Most likely rotated. Definitely rotated out. Next card is Robin. I already know Foodies loves this card. This card. So what this card does is, once per turn, when an ally crits or evades, you draw a card for free. For free. If you are assaulting your opponent with on-hit skills, you force your opponent into a lose-lose situation where either you proc the on-hit skill or you draw a card for free. Um, if you are hitting your opponent with double orb breaks, you force your opponent into a lose-lose situation where you either you draw a card or they get two orbs broken in one move. One move. If your opponent's on zero orbs, you force them into a lose-lose situation where either you draw a card or they lose the game. Lose the game. So this is a kind of card where it has to be put in a deck that's already kind of made around it, or if you're running it as your MC, the deck has to kind of be built around it. If your deck already puts on a lot of offensive pressure, it could be good. It could be good, and if your deck already has on-hit skills, skills, or if your MC has on-hit skills, for example, it could also be pretty good. Because it forces them into that loose, loose, loose situation where you either prop beyond his skill or you draw the card. And it's always a free, free card. The other approach to using this card is instead of forcing your opponent to evade or incentivizing your opponent to evade, you force your opponent to crit. That's what I originally tried to do with this card. I don't think that deck is very good. <laughs> very good, but that's what I originally that's what I originally tried when I tried I'm seeing this. Seeing this. Um, but the other approach is you can put a very thick unit on the front line, a very beefy unit on the front line, front line that your opponent 
path to crit in order to break through. Um, and I'll actually cite one of Cypher Bear's videos for that. For that one, if you look at Robin versus Lucina, you will notice that the Robin deck does exactly that. He takes Robin, moves him back behind a Hector that are masked up, so Hector is base 100. In order to break through the Hector, you have to crit it, or you have to buff a unit to an absurd amount. Well, so if you can't buff a unit to an absurd amount to hit a base 100 Hector without a crit, you either leave the Hector there, or you crit and give Robin a card. Card. So it's a good card if you have if you already have certain things in your deck. Otherwise, it's meh, in my opinion. Next card is Marsha. Uh, Marsha is a type of card that I like to put in a number of decks, and then someone, probably Kokushu, says you don't need it. Need it? Most of the time, you really don't need it. The vast majority of the time, you don't need it, but it's a nice card to have sometimes. sometimes. What it does is, when it attacks, so it doesn't need to hit anything, it just needs to attack, you can flip two bonds to heal a copy of your MC. If your MC is a stack of Four or higher, is it? Yes, four or higher. You only need to put one bomb. Four. So it is a very efficient MC main character heal if your main character has a stack already. So you're mostly using this in green decks, or Amelia, if you are using it at all. It is not a staple in any deck whatsoever. Whatsoever, and I do mean any deck whatsoever. But if you are playing Ike, Micaiah, Amelia, or some other stupid deck that's hitting a 4 stack, you could put it in and it'll be useful. Useful, just not all that important to your game plan. Your game plan. Uh, Mia... Oh, now we're going to on hit, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to on hit now. Now, Mia... What Mia does, uh, it's not that important of a card, so I'll probably go over it quickly, since I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually haven't made as much progress with this video as I really wanted to. Wanted to. Um, if you flip a face, a bond face down, when you hit something, you mill the top four cards of your deck and add one of them to your hand, saying the rest into the retreat area. All I'll say about this is it's an, it's an on-hit pseudo-heal, and I say pseudo-heal as in uh, you're given a selection of four cards and you pick one. So you don't have an unlimited selection of cards to grab, but for one bond, it's decent. Decent. Also, if you want to get a lot of things in your retreat quickly, if you want to mill a lot of your deck into your retreat quickly, it's not a bad card. It's not a bad card. Uh, there's a better card in green that does this. It's much better, actually. That I will get to later on in the video. Video. This is a usable card, but it's not that important. Uh, next card is Alina. I'll actually mention both Alina and Erica at once, since they do basically the exact same thing. On hit, when you pro when you proc them as an attack support, if the unit attacking hits the opponent, you draw a card for free. The difference between these two is that Alina is Alina is if your attacking unit is purple. And Erica is if your attacking unit hits the main character, so it's not that's not just any unit. So they're not interchangeable. Lelina is definitely better. I will go ahead and say Lelina is definitely better. Erica is useful in some decks. Erica is useful in Randall and Lynn, and that's about all I can think of in terms of that. You could probably find use for Erica in some other deck. Mode. So Lelina is a staple in purple, simply because you can just randomly proc her. Randomly, you can just randomly proc while you hit something and draw a free card, or you can stack Lelina, Lelina, kill something and draw a card, and draw a card. So half the time it's a one, half the time it is a one for one draw. The other half the time you sometimes just get a card for free. Card for free it is very good. Um, Lelina is also going to show up in the next video, to you because she can also destroy things. Or anything, so for the sake of this video, just know she can draw you cards. You can also stack her draw cards. If you're playing Kanas or if you're running Kanas, you can use Kanas 
to stack Melina and then rig a card that you want to draw with Melina. Draw with Melina. You know, which essentially turns this card into a one-for-one -one heal, even, instead of a one-for-one -one draw. And draw, which is even more potent. So if you're running purple, run this card. That, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to say here. If you're running purple, run this card. Uh, I wouldn't run Claire in anything. I'm gonna be honest, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, but it's not a bad... She's not a bad card, I just wouldn't run her in anything. Basically, when she hits something, she gets a one-for-one -one main character heal. Heal? A one-for-one -one main character heal is pretty efficient, but you have to hit your opponent. And she's base 60. If you're confident that you can hit the opponent, so that you can... If you're confident you can buff her to hit the opponent, then maybe you could run her. But even then, I probably wouldn't. Maybe in Micaiah, and that's all I'd ever... I'd only consider running her in Micaiah, and that's about it. And I wouldn't even run her in Micaiah most of the time. Most of the time. Technically, there's Sigrun. Technically, there's Quan, But you're taking up so much space with a lot of other cards that you probably wouldn't run this card anyway. Still, it's an idea to consider. So, I'll mention it. Mention it. Uh, this card is really only useful in one deck, and that is Male Corrin. It is really only useful in one variant of Male Corrin, and that is an Archer-heavy Male Corrin build. Male Corrin build. Even at that point, point, Obro does the exact same thing. Uh, she's a useful card. Card. She is still an on-hit flip one to draw a card card, but she's only really useful in one deck, and she isn't even a staple in that deck. In that deck. So, keep this card on the radar, but not in the center of the radar. Of the radar. Uh, this is a new card. Card. This card is when this card hits the main character. When this card hits the main character, Flip one to oh no it's not flip one to draw a card it's just when it hits the main character draw a card card that is really good on a base 70 that's already applying a bunch of pressure on the opponent through its other skill that being said it is on hit so there is obviously the contingent it is obviously contingent on your opponent not dodging your attack uh, what makes it even worse is that it's the main character, and the main character is already running more dodges than anything else in their deck. Their deck. Th their deck. They are very likely to dodge. <laughs> they are incredibly likely to dodge if you are attacking the main character with a skill like this. So it is not a. It is not a very easy skill to get off. But it is. It's there. Just know that it's there. If you're building Rainbow Tempo, this card is there. You're going to be running this card in Rainbow Tempo anyway. If you're building Alphonse, if you're building Krom, you're going to be running this card anyway. So it's not a card that I would run red specifically for, for but considering you're running this card in those types of decks anyway, it's a skill to consider. So that's all. Um... Sita, right. Is there anything else here? No. Sita uh, is also on hit. Same problem as Claire. Um, she's on hit and she's also a base 60, so, sh so she's not guaranteed to hit anything unless you buff her. Buff her and it's contingent on your opponent not dodging. At the very least, she's... At the very least, you are already running her in flyer decks. And at the very least... The yeah, at the very least, you're already running her in Flyer decks. Flyer decks. At the very least, she does something else other than just draw you a card if she hits something. Hits something. But it's the same problem as Claire, where she's mostly filler, if anything. And if I'm not already running a Flyer deck, I'm probably not even running her as filler. It's filler. So... Basically, I think of Sita slightly higher than Claire just because she's used in more decks, but outside of the decks where you'd specifically outside of the specific decks where you'd use her, I don't think of her that much more highly than Claire to be honest. 
surprise. It's just on hit, draw a card. Actually, it's on hit, draw a card for free, so she's actually much better than Claire in that regard. But she still has to hit. She still has to be buffed to the point where she hits, or she still has to hit something that's less than 70 base power. Or, and they still have to not dodge you. Have to not dodge you. That being said, said, and I'll actually bring this up after I'm done with all the on hit skills, which. Yeah, we're almost done with those. So, um, there is a thing to note about all of these cards. Cards that I'll mention later. Um. Actually, I'll just add a, I'll just add a subtitle if I remember. Uh, there's another Cedo here that's on hit. Basically, Claire. <laughs> this card is basically Claire, but instead of just picking your MC, you just get to pick a red card. Right. It's a red card from the deck, but you also have to reveal it. Have to reveal it. So they're incredibly similar cards. Cards. Uh, this is a new card that you can run in a number of purple decks. You can also run this card in Rainbow Temple. I've seen this card run in Rainbow Temple. But what it basically is, is when this unit destroys an enemy, uh, you can flip a bond to add the supporting card to your hand. Of course, you can also flip that same bond to deploy that card. So you have a choice between which one you want to do. Want to do. But if you hit your opponent, and you want and you like the card that you just got as a support, you can just add it to your hand. And let's say it's a dodge or something already on the field, you can just add it to your hand. And let's say it's an MC dodge, you can just add it to your hand. Let's say it's a one cost that you're not going to get a lot of value out of deploying, you can just add it to your hand. And so I say that's pretty good. I say it's all right. I should say. Say. Only certain decks are going to be running it. Okay. And then... And then we have Lucina. I honestly don't know what decks I would put Lucina in. Lucina in. But... In, but she exists, so I might as well go over her. Uh, pretty much, while she exists on the field, if a class change unit destroys an enemy, you can flip on a draw card. So it's efficient, but you have to hit someone with something that is class change. Change. So it has that same contingency that a lot of these other cards have. Uh, she can buff your field at the very least. At least, so I see a reason to run her in maybe some decks. I just can't think of those decks right now. Decks right now. Yeah, I just can't think of those decks right now. It's right now. Something that I will say about all of these cards, just in case I didn't put in, this, in the subtitles already, is that, is that all of these on-hit cards, even if your opponent dodges them, it's still, by technicality, a minus one to your hand. They still have to evade in order to deny you the value. So it's not reliable. Going for on-hit skills isn't reliable. But if your opponent dodges, it's not the end of the world. That being said, now we are heading into niche cards. Some of these cards are really good in very specific situations. Situations or in very specific decks. Different decks. First card I'll go over, Tiana. Uh, some people like to put two or three Tiana in every purple deck, because if your opponent runs a lot of dragons, you can just completely destroy them with this card. Right. You tap this unit, and you flip one, you destroy every non-main character dragon stone unit on the screen, and then for each one you destroy, you draw one. You draw one card. You can also stack a card from the retreat on top of your deck for free, if you destroy something, or if you use this skill, including including some of these support skills I mentioned earlier, that can just draw you cards or mill cards from your hand. Yeah, so if your opponent's deck and your opponent's field is very manica heavy, you can just deploy this card, card and make their life miserable. Bye. 
miserable. It's not a bad idea to put two of these in every deck, especially if you really care about stacking something specific. It's not a bad idea to run two, three, or four of them in your deck. Your deck. It's just not always the best use of deck space. Deck space. If you have nothing better to put in your deck, you might as well put this in your deck, is what I'm trying to say. Trying to say. Maria, this card is broken. If you're playing a flyer MC, that's that's a very big if. If you are playing a flyer MC, or if you are playing a deck with a lot of flyers in general, this card is really broken. Because whenever a flyer MC, whenever a flyer card, sorry, destroys an enemy, you flip one to draw a card. This is whatever any whatever any flying alley destroys an enemy. Enemy, they can probably dodge one hit to deny you one card, but they can't dodge everything if you're attacking them with four flyers at once. So if this thing's on the field and you're attacking with a lot of flyers, flyers, you will probably draw at least one or two cards this way. If this thing manages to stay on the field and your opponent does a lot of dodging the previous turn, they probably won't be able to dodge a lot of stuff the subsequent turn. Turn. So as long as you can keep this card on the field, on the field, and you can keep putting up pressure with flyers specifically, you can exploit your opponent and draw a lot of cards this way. But the reason why it's only really that good in flyer decks is first off, a flyer card needs to hit, needs to hit, and second off, it is a cost four base fifty unless you have a flyer. It is a cost four base fifty unit unless you have a flyer ally. Fire ally, in which case it is a cost. If it's cost, if it's a cost two base fifty that flips one for every time a flyer ally kills something, it's broken. It's just broken. Otherwise, it's a meh card. Meh card because it's a cost four that has a hard time hitting things, hitting things. And if it's attacking just by itself, then it's a lot harder to get the value out of it. But in flyer decks, again, it's really good. If you are running a flyer deck, you should run this card 100% of the time. If you're running a very flyer heavy deck, you should run this card 100% of the time. Percent of the time. Uh, Scrimere. Scrimere is an incredibly niche card. Pretty much only run this in Fang decks, if you can even be bothered to run this in Fang decks. The draw element here is if you manage to stack a card underneath this card. If you manage to grow this card, you can draw a card for free. Most of the time, growthing this unit isn't free to begin with. Begin with, but sometimes it is. In some cases, you can growth this unit for essentially free, which means you can essentially draw a free card this way. This way. That being said, in order to make this card work, in order to you to make use of this card's draw skill, you have to commit yourself to not only running this card, not only running enough cards to consistently get a growth when you have it available to. But also the cards that growth this card, since you can't manually growth this card without at least, well, the assistance of another card. Another card, which means it has to be more likely than not an eight card combo for one draw per turn, and that's about it. About it. It's not very good unless you are already running those cards. If you are already running Jill, fine. If you are already running Enna, then fine. Then fine. But otherwise, I don't see a, I don't see it. A reason. Reason to use this card. You can still you can still use it if you are already running Jill or Ina, but most of the time I just don't see the card. Point. Next card I will talk about Minerva. Pretty much white. Pretty much run this in white wings, and that's it. This card is a Tap, flip one, is a tap, flip one, choose a dragon flyer unit to add to your hand. Yeah. So pretty much either Travant if you feel like running him, or White Wings if you are playing that deck. And that's those are the only situations where this card is really good. It's the only situation where this card does anything of value. In those deck, in those specific specific situations, this can be a pretty valuable card as flip one to heal something. Flip one to heal a specific card is peak efficiency. 
it is quite possibly the most efficient heal you can do. Of course, this isn't just flip one, it is tap flip one, which is much worse than flip one, because you deny yourself an attack this way. An attack this way. If you're deploying this instead of something else, you deny yourself a potential attack, which could get rid of something. Something. But tap flip one to heal something specific is much more efficient than tap flip two to heal something specific, and that's about all I will say about this card. Speaking of flip one to heal something specific, though, though, meet Cordelia and Severa. Blue Flyers are kind of a dead meta. Blue Flyers are kind of a dead meta right now, but if you are running a lot of blue, you can run a lot of blue Flyers and still kind of make it work. If you're like Jadex and you're still holding on to the Cordelia Dream, then you can make these cards work too. Do and if you feel like running an, an unorthodox flyer deck that happens to run a lot of blue instead of a lot of green, red, or yellow, yellow, you can run these cards and make them work. Um, both of these cards do the exact same thing in terms of healing. At the end of your turn, you flip one bond to add a blue flying unit that is not their respective name. So if you're using Cordelia's, it can't be Cordelia. If you're using Severa, it can't be Severa. At the end of the turn, you flip one to add a blue flyer that's not one of these these to your hand. Uh, pretty much what I just pretty much what I just said. Uh, flip one to heal something specific is the most efficient you could possibly get in this game. You can get in this game. So yeah, it's pretty yeah, they're pretty good in decks where you'd want to put them in. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> put them in something. I wouldn't put them in anything that's not already running blue, or something that's not already running blue flyers, but if you intend on running blue flyers for whatever reason, these cards are pretty good in that context. In that context. Oh, now we have to talk about this archetype. So, uh, there are cards that exist in this game that check the top card of your opponent's deck. This card exists with different names across almost every color. Yeah, almost every color. The exception, I think, is maybe white. I don't recall if black has one. I know for a fact white doesn't have one. And I could even be wrong about that. Basically, you tap if the card, reveal the top card of your opponent's deck, if it's three cost or higher, you draw a card. So sometimes it's tap, oh, sorry, you flip one to draw a card if it's three cost or higher. So it's tap to maybe flip one to draw a card, which is mad. It's not consistent, it's not reliable. Reliable. It's mostly good, it's mostly useful in decks where you are trying to sack your opponent. Which means you want their, which means you want to see what their support is, support is, or MCs that specifically want to check top of your opponent's deck. So decks like Jafar and Matthew might appreciate cards like this. If you want to find cards like this, probably just look up. Probably just look up Lock Touch. And you will find a number of cards of this skill. For cards of this skill. Uh, there's something else you could probably look up in order to find this exact same skill. Another thing you could probably look up is... Well, I guess you have to, I guess you have to figure that out on your own, but you can look up Lock Touch and find a few of them. Them. These cards exist in most colors. If you want to find a card like this, probably just look up the name of whatever the thief character of that respective Fire Emblem game is. So if you're looking at red, Julian. If you're looking at blue, Gaius. If you're looking at green, probably look up Volk or Soph. If you're looking up yellow, look up Patty. If you're looking up purple, look up Matthew, Lila, um, Jafar, those characters. If you're looking up black, look up Nina. You can look up Niles. Again, I don't remember what happened. Again, I do not remember if half of them even have Lock Touch, but if you want any of Lock Touch, you can obviously just look that up. Uh, 
most of the time it's not, most of the time the card isn't good anyway. Anyway, again, it's a tap to maybe flip one to draw a card. One sometimes is just a waste of time, sometimes it's pretty good. Pretty good. You still have to put 10 supports in there, so uh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, then you have Patty. Patty is a unique thief unit where she just has a ridiculous combo. Combo, and that's about it. You can, if you tap and flip one, you pretty much begin executing this ridiculously long, drawn out combo that I don't even feel like reading out, but you can obviously read it on the screen here. Here, or just search it up on Lackey. Lackey. You just need to get through the first step in order to draw a card, but it is still a tap flip one to maybe draw a card. Card. There are just there just so happen to be extra goodies attached to this. Um, at this rate, I'm just going to actually no. There's just extra goodies attached to this. Uh, are we doing something resembling almost being done? I think we're almost done if we move quickly. Uh, Tina is a kind of lock touch unit that isn't a ten support, but other than that, same problems arise. Other than that, same problems arise. Uh, it is a tap to maybe draw a card. At least you don't have to flip one if you meet the condition. At least you can do the skill twice at the cost of one bond. Cost of one bond, but bond. At least it's flexible to the type of deck you're going up against. If they're running a lot of three cost, or if they're running a lot of one cost. Cost, but it's still very unreliable, so sometimes it can just be a complete waste of a turn. turn. And even if it's not a complete waste of a turn, it's not an impactful use of your turn. It's not like you're playing Ilion or May. Or May. You're just tapping to maybe draw a card. Uh, is it Bond Excel season yet? It's Bond Excel season. So, Bond Excel is very good. Bond Excel allows you to outpace your opponent in terms of the power level of cards that you can put on the field. A best, best example of that is it allows you to put out overclass cards much faster. It allows you to put very high cost units out much faster. Much faster. And also quickly gets you to a point where you can deploy a lot of units on the screen more quickly. More quickly. Uh, more quickly. Generally, the best way of ramping in the early game, post-rotation, the, the best and most of the time the only way to bond Excel early game is through Manica Emblems, emblems where if you proc a Manica Emblem and the attacking unit's color corresponds with the, your supporting card, you add a card to your bonds from your hand. This combos pretty well with cards this card co like this combos pretty well with efficient draw cards that flip bonds to draw cards such as obro such as pretty much all the cards I remember at the start of the video it also combos well with cards that net you a lot of value in a short amount of time if your hand size is low such as May, Matthew and Ileana if you're looking for mannequin emblems emblems, you're going to find four in blue, two in purple, one in red, and if you're playing in the pre-rotation meta, where sets one through four are available, there is one in white and one in black as well. As well. The good thing about Bond Excel is that, first off, sometimes you can stack it. Uh, second off, second off, it can proc randomly for free without you having to do anything. And if you run, a, if you are playing purple or blue, and you're running enough of them, there is a very good chance of you randomly proccing it at least once in time for it to actually matter. Uh, but on the downside, it's inconsistent. If you can't stack it, you can't rely on you can't rely on proccing it, even if you've maximized the odds of it happening. You cannot rely on it, and even if you have options to stack it, you still cannot rely on it. It has the obvious caveat. Um. In some decks, you can run one of those cards. For example, 
In pre-rotation Obero, I like to run cost 1 Kana, which has Mannequin Emblem, a lot. Because if I don't randomly proc it, it's no big deal. If I do randomly proc it, proc it, I can punch my opponent's face into the ground much faster down the line. line. So I found it to be a very worthy inclusion to that deck. You might find a Maka Emblem to be a very worthy inclusion to whatever deck you might be trying to build. Um, it's worth noting that that, that there are also Dragon Blood emblems that exist. Green and yellow actually have those. They're not that good. Good, so I'm not mentioning them. This is where we get all of our ramp options out. So, first things first. Uh, Family. Uh, Family. Now, uh, before I talk about the cards, it's a friendly PSA. Uh, this, is going, this is the third and final black card to appear in this video. Now... I know a lot of you might be trying to build black decks, a lot of you guys might want to build black decks, but a friendly PSA, if you want uh, cards that put other cards in your hand, don't run black. If you want cards that generate any sort of value whatsoever, don't run black. If you want cards that keep cards out of your opponent's hand, don't run black. In fact, just don't run black. Running black's a bad idea. You can run black if you want to, it's just objectively worse than every other color right now. Now, that being said, Femily. What Femily does is, you bond a black card from your hand in order to destroy something on your opponent's side of the screen. It is a very high value skill, because you can just turn that bond, that black card, into value when you place it in your bonds, and you get to blow something up for that. for that. So you barely have to commit anything unless you happen to want every black card that's in your hand, which is understandable sometimes if the only black card in your hand is like family and whatever whatever other good black card you have. Good card you have, which doesn't exist, but that's besides the point. Like, the point is a the point is a very potent skill. To downsize to running this card is first off it is a cost six unit unit. So you're only ever getting this out if your deck is an incredibly late game deck, or if you are playing old school Crom and you can class change into this thing turn four, or turn five, turn five. Even that even then it's barely early. Early. The other downside is you have to run black for it. You have to commit yourself to running black. Black, and black barely has anything in the way of good cards, so good luck with that. Next card I'll go over is a new card. It's Deirdre. It's pretty good. If you're running yellow, Deirdre makes yellow a better color. Better color, but specifically it makes mono yellow a better deck archetype. Maybe not yellow splash per se. But it makes mono yellow a better type of deck. deck. So what it does is it reveals flip one bond face down, real top card of your deck and place in the bond area. Um, you don't have to add it. You just flip a bond to add a bond. So in terms of the amount of face up bonds that you have that you can convert value into, so long as that card is yellow, that number doesn't change. That number doesn't change. What you did was just add a bond, a, what you did was just add one to the total number of bonds that you have, without subtracting from your hand size or the total number of face-up bonds that you have. Value-wise, it is liter it is free, it is the freest thing you could possibly do. It's not super impactful, it's not, doesn't affect the board state that much, but in terms of value, it is really good. If you happen to get lucky and proc a card with a bond skill, it's even better. Better. And I've already mentioned, and I've already gone over several, a couple of cards that have bond skills. I'm going to go over a few more in a little bit because that's where, because this section, this bond excel bond refresh section that we're going into, into, is uh, very yellow heavy. This is where yellow shines. Yellow shines. You can probably a lot of those bonds go off of this skill as well. So this card bond excels you essentially for free. 
Tree. It is the best Bond Excel tool that Yellow has, and it's arguably one of the best Bond Excel tools in the game, if you're running Mono Yellow, of course. Uh, speaking of Yellow, we have Nana. Nana is a card you run if you want to kill yourself. <laughs> kill yourself. If you are really crazy about getting a lot of Bonds <laughs> in your Bond Zone in a very short amount of time, uh, you can run Nana. I can think of two applications for this. One is running Leaf as your MC, MC, since you want to get to eight bonds very quickly. The other is for a card I will mention down the line. Down the line. Uh, run Deirdre instead, most of the time. Most of the time. This card flips two to add two bonds to your bond zone face down. <laughs> Base down. So you minus two yourself in terms of bonds you can flip for value. You can flip for value, bonds you can flip down for cards. Cards. And the bonds that you get are face down as well. It's down as well. So pretty much uh, most of the time you are not splashing this card at all. This card at all. Unless you are really crazy about having a really high bond count for some reason. Uh, I know Twins likes this card sometimes. And if you're running um, Liana and Rowan together as MC, uh, they like this card sometimes, but they won't always run this card. All right. Next card is Tiki. I'm actually mentioning two Tiki. I'm mentioning three Tiki's at once. Uh, there's another Tiki in here somewhere. Hold up. Actually, no. <laughs> Apparently, there isn't. Apparently, apparently there isn't. Uh, so, I guess we're talking about two TVs at once. One of them is rotation. This red Tiki is rotated out. It is set one. This one over here is still legal, but this one is on hit. They both give you a bond for free on attack. What this card does is, as soon as it attacks, as soon as it reveals the support, you can send it to the bond area bond area for free it is literally a free bond free bond if you have ways of drawing cards efficiently then a turn down the line that free bond a turn or two or not maybe not even a turn maybe like a minute down the line that free bond that you get from attacking with this thing just turns into a card because you flipped that bond that bond that you had to do basically no commitment for before. It's not a very impactful card. In fact, if you put it out before you have eight bonds, it might not change the state of the board at all. But it gives you a... And if it's out before you have eight bonds, it is very easy to get rid of. But outside of that, can't go wrong with free bonds, let me tell you. Uh, this card is basically the same thing. It's much better at actually killing things, because it, is it, if, it's the, if it's the first thing that's attacking, then it's base 100. If you happen to have 7 bonds, that turns into base 110. There is basically no way it can miss anything, except for maybe Zelda or Hector, if she sells. If she sells. If she hits, she adds the top card of the deck to the bond zone. Zone. Which means she gets stopped by her opponent dodging. Tiki gets stopped from Tiki is prevented from adding that bond if she sells. This Tiki is prevented from adding that bond. From adding that bond. If uh, she doesn't hit, and pretty much if the opponent dodges, not even if she doesn't hit. Yeah, but they can both get you essentially free bonds, which eventually translates into into more cards to add to your hand in one way or another. another. So I think these cards are pretty good. Uh, Julia over here is a pretty good card in, pretty good card in yellow. It's a little bit overshadowed by Deirdre, but she has some applications aside from Deirdre. If this unit attacks and hits something, she can flip one to choose a card from the deck, hand pick a card from the deck, and add it to the bond zone, which means basically the same thing I said about Deirdre. The amount of face-up bonds that you have does not change, meaning the amount of bonds that you can get value out of does not change. 
What changes is the amount of bonds that you have that actually increases. So it is a raw improvement. If it hits. <laughs> if she hits. She hits. You can also use the skill again to activate bond skills when you put them in the bond zone through the skill. And I'm going to go over the, one of those cards very soon. One of those cards puts this entire yellow package together quite nicely. Nice. But just know that this card is pretty good if you are running yellow. Yellow. If you are running yellow ramp, this is a pretty good card to put in your deck. Card to put in your deck. Oh, speaking of that card, hi Stella. So uh, this is the card that I keep alluding to. Uh, every time, every time I mention a yellow card that tampers with the bond zone, I keep alluding to this card. What this card does is it does two very impactful things with bonds. The first impactful thing it does with bonds is if Seleph ends up being placed in the bond zone through the effect of a skill, such as Julia's skill, such as Deirdre's skill. Deirdre's skill. The skill. Uh, what he does is he just unflips a bond. You just unflip one of your bonds, you can get value out of that bond all over again. If you have flip one for ones in your deck, you can flip that bond all over again, draw a card all over again, just by placing this card in your bond zone. So that's pretty good. good. The next ability that he has is Final Holy War. So if you are running enough Seleph in your deck, and you happen to have another one in your hand while this thing's on the field, you can discard a Seleph to add as many bonds from the bond zone back to your hand as you want. So if it is... If the game is close to being over, and the amount of bonds you have doesn't necessarily matter, you can proc the skill and just add a bunch of cards back to your hand from the bond zone at once. If you have a crap ton of bonds, bonds, more than you could possibly, if you have more face down bonds than you could possibly ever need, because realistically, most of the time you are not going to need 10 bonds or 11 or 12 or anything around that number, if you have that level of excess, and a lot of those bonds are face down, you can just final holy war and add all of those face down bonds back to your hand. In terms of bonds that you can get value out of, that number doesn't change. In terms of the amount of plays you can make per turn, that number doesn't go down by a whole lot. But all of a sudden you have all of these extra cards in your hand in your hand. And odds are, if you have a lot of cards in your hand, a lot of them are probably, a lot of cards in your bonds, a lot of them are probably pretty useful. I actually cite the last video I uploaded a second time, because in that exact same deck I mentioned, the whole premise of that deck is ramp an insane amount, is ramp an insane amount, and then drop this card Final Holy War, all of the cards back into your hand. Uh, I call it a bad deck, because it is, but it works. <laughs> it works when it feels like it. Feels like it. But when it doesn't work, it's not the fault of Celeb, it's just the fault of other parts of the deck, or the fault of the deck not having certain things like me. Like me. When I drop this card, I just added nine cards. I just added nine cards from my bonds back to my hand, and I didn't feel any sort of negative difference in terms of the amount of bonds that I had. So I have. That's essentially... That's pretty much what happens when you use this card. You just add a bunch of cards back to your hand, and you don't notice a real negative impact in terms of plays that you can make. Make. So this is a very good way of unflipping bonds. The most versatile way of unflipping bonds in the entire game is running two to four two three or four of this card in combination with two three or four of this card this is a combination that you can put in any bond heavy deck and it'll it'll work and it won't take up too much space space what you do is you bond leaf you bond leaf then you use leaf's bond skill at some point to swap the, the leaf in your bond zone 
with a Celeph from your hand. And when you swap the Leaf and the Celeph, Celeph's Bond skill activates and you unflip a Bond. Bond. Obvious upside is, again, you don't have to commit yourself to running any more yellow than this in order to make the combo work. Work. Obvious downside is if you draw Celeph and no Leaf, it's basically a dead card, it doesn't do much. Do much. So, or half time it'll be a dead card, it doesn't do much anyway. Anyway. Um, it is a pr very good tech option in a lot of decks. I know that Deke runs this a lot of the time. A lot of the time. So, th so this is always something to consider if you are very concerned about bond space. If you're running this, half the time you don't need to run anything else in the other, is what I'm trying to say. Usually doing it once or twice is enough. Is enough. Uh, since this has been going on long enough, we're going to rapid fire through some of these. So... So, both of these on flip stuff. Both of these just draw on flip. Deirdre is at the end of your turn. Deirdre is at the end of your turn. Your turn, automatically unflip one. Linoan is at the end of your turn, automatically unflip one, if you have six or more bond cards. On face value, you would think that Deirdre is, on, is better 100% of the time. There are cases where you'd rather use Linoan. If you are running Dragonstone units, like now we like Tiki, you'd probably rather use Linoan. You know, because Deirdre keeps Dragonstone units tapped indefinitely while she is on screen. Screen. Both yours and the opponents get tapped indefinitely while she is on the screen. Uh, that and Linoan's a 3 cost and Deirdre's a 4 cost. So those are differences between the two. You can run either of them. There are reasons to run one over the other depending on what your deck is and what's in your deck. Uh, Deirdre 1 is a card that you can run in a lot of yellow decks. Decks. Mostly what she does, mostly her purpose, what she does for purposes of this video is when you deploy her, you exchange one of your bonds for a Celeph and unflip something. You exchange one of your bonds for this Celeph 5-4 that I mentioned earlier and you unflip something. You can also exchange it for a Tine, a Lachesis, or any other card with a bond skill that I might mention either in this video or a future video. So that's that. The same way how there's a 6-5 mommy that it, the six five family that exists, there's a 6-5 mommy that exists. Um, he grabs a white bond from the bond zone in order to deploy a bunch of low-cost cards. It's not a bond on flip is what we call this is what we call a bond refresh. It basically does the sell of thing where where you take a bond that is already flipped down, you've already gotten value out of it, you add it back to your hand where you can use it. You can use it. So that's pretty good. Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, all four of these cards also do that. All four of these cards also do that with slight differences. So, Naui 3 is the best one. Out of oh wait there's a there's a fourth yeah there's a fifth one all five of these cards do that now we all five of these cards do that now we three is the best one it's one because she's cost three which means the amount she's cost three uh, at the threshold of six bonds she is range one to two she's a range one to two base eighty base eighty and it's automatic at the, it's automatic at the end of your turn automatic at the end of your turn makes it less versatile. By technicality. technicality, but if you're playing the long game, it won't matter that much most of the time. Time. And while I do say it's the best of these cards, it's also rotated out. So if you're playing standard format, you can't use it. Use it. If you're playing in standard format, it's a conversation about these four cards. Four cards. Really, there's no point in stacking Mur against these three. Against these. Because if you're running Mur, your deck is purple, and if you're running these guys, your deck is blue. Is blue, and there are very few blue-purple hybrid decks that I can think of that exist. Look at this. Mur, Mur is basically a uh, Naui without range. Pur Nur Mur is purple Naui without range, but she's also not restricted to do it at the end of your turn. You, you can do it at any point during your turn with Mur. So that's pretty good. Good. Nah has to flip a bond for it, so... 
Uh, that's an L. She's it's not a bad card. It's definitely not a bad card. It still takes a card that's in your bond zone and makes use out of it. It's use out of it. It just flips a bond to do it, which makes it worse. Worse. Uh, cost 5 Tiki is basically a 60 range version of cost 3 Naui. Only, only instead of being forced to grab a card from the bond zone at the end of your turn, you also have the option of just adding a card to the bond zone from your hand at the start of your turn, at the end of your turn, sorry. Your turn, so technically you have options. Options, but you'd probably rather do something else. Something else. Uh, bot tells me that it's pretty good in Nana, but that's about all I can say to this card. Alright. I mean, it was enough to get me to put it in this video last second, but I don't think that much of this card. A lot of people don't think that much of this card. Haruno is heart. Haruno is heartbroken by this card. By this card, it's all right. It's serviceable. A little bit of face competition from the other cards. Uh, in my opinion, probably the best of the bond refreshing cards right now is Naui. Naui, if you have seven or bonds, seven or more bonds, is a 91 to two range. When she attacks, if she was the first thing to attack on the turn, she does the bond refresh thing, where she takes a bond from the deck and puts it in your hand. And caveat is she's cost four. She's very vulnerable to attack if if she doesn't have seven or more bonds, and you have to attack first with this thing, which usually doesn't matter that much. Much. Just think of this as a slightly worse Naui 3, but again, Naui 3 is rotated out, so it doesn't matter most of the time. So that's the Bond Excel section done. Done. Uh, I have this here. This is a very strange, very unorthodox card. So, I only have this card here in case someone feels like running a gimmick deck that runs a lot of Risen. If you are running a gimmick deck that runs a lot of Risen, this is the most high value card in the entire game. Entire game. If your deck has a lot of Risen, if your deck has a lot of Risen, uh, you just kind of uh, <laughs> mill three cards in your deck, grab th and grab three Risen from the retreat for free, at no cost whatsoever. It's once per turn, but it's at no cost whatsoever. That's already three cards in your hand. Granted, they don't do anything unless you do something with them. Something with them. Uh, but there are definitely ways to do something with them. So, something with them. Obviously, it's a zero support. Obviously, it requires you to run more zero supports. So, 90, in 99% of decks, this is still a bad card. Because even if you grab three cards for free, they don't do anything. But if you build a deck, if you build a gimmick deck around Risen this card will be the backbone of that deck. That deck, which is why I mention it here. Mention it here. Now we have uh, these cards at once. These, now we are going into raw healers. Not on-hit healers, just raw healers. I'm going to pull out these five at once because I'm just like, out running out of time. Out of time. I will group these three together and then talk about these two and talk about start talking about these separately. So what all three of these do is they flip three bonds to grab two cards from the retreat, which is one and a half bonds per card. It's more efficient than two bonds per card, but it's less efficient than one bond per card, with the trade-off of course of being able to pick those two cards. Being able to choose two cards from the retreat and put them in your hand is a pretty powerful skill. Skill. Cool. Differences between the three of these cards, Jenny is cost four. Jenny's cost four, most of the time she's not coming out until turn five. Elincia and Maria, well sometimes she's not coming out until turn four or turn five. Elincia and Maria over here, over here, if your promotion is turn four or turn two, you can pull them out. Them out as early as turn three and heal. Uh, outside of that, Jenny doesn't. Outside of that, um, individual advantages. Jenny is base sixty and can attack after healing, and Elincia is a thirty support, which is occasionally convenient. Is occasionally convenient. Uh, 
Jenny is going to <laughs> Jenny is going to pop up uh, later on in this video, probably in like ten minutes. In ten minutes, uh, cards broken. <laughs> this card especially is broken. These cards are also pretty good, but this card especially is broken. Is broken, as I will talk about a little bit later. Sakura doesn't see use in anything. She legitimately doesn't see use in anything. She can see use in a number of things. You can use her in Mamoui, you can use her in Femoui, you can use her in Xander. No one uses her in those things, but you can certainly try if you feel like it. Like it. Basically, she is a tap flip three to draw three cards. If you have fewer orbs than your opponent, you tapping doesn't matter, and if your MC is cost five or higher, they get a buff. Alright, they got a buff. Um, so is it incredibly burst? Is it, like, an incredibly, like... It's, an, it's a burst option. It is the most burst burst option to have ever burst option, basically. Option. It is extremely inflexible, but it, it is occasionally pretty potent. So it's something to consider, but I never run it. I never run it. Most people I know never run it. Right, just bear it in mind if you're building a white deck or if you're building a five cost MC. Uh, we're pull we're diving into the realm of efficient, relatively efficient healing or relatively unorthodox healing. So we'll just rapid fire through these. Uh, this card is basically flip a red bond to add a cost one non lena card. Again, flip one to heal something specific is pretty efficient, but you're restricted to a red bond in a one cost unit. So, cost unit. So sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's pretty mad. She has the additional effect of being able to to uh, shuffle your opponent's retreat into your deck, which is really useful against decks like Sigrun, against decks that deploy from yeah, against decks that deploy from retreat like Sigrun, or against growth decks like Makai or Ike. Makai or Ike. Uh, Mikoto is good in white decks that go into late game. The few and far between white decks that actually try to do that. <laughs> do that. She is tap, send two face down cards to your retreat area to choose a non Makoto card from the retreat to add to your hand. Again, you're choosing a specific card from the retreat to add to your hand, which is pretty good. Which is pretty good. I'm um, sending two face down cards to the bond area to your retreat area can be a hefty cost if you don't have a ridiculous excess of bonds. If you have a ridiculous excess of bonds, if you have more bonds you could ever need, then you don't care. <laughs> you don't care. And that, and that situation is literally, is effectively tap to heal if you do not care about pitching two face down bonds. If you have like 10 bonds somehow, you don't care about pitching two face down bonds. It's essentially tap to heal, which is the most efficient thing in the entire game. In reality, it's not tap to heal, but in effect, sometimes it is tap to heal. Tap to heal. Lian, uh, yeah. Send one, tap this, send a card from your hand to retreat area. It's basically a cycling of your hand, but instead of draw discard, like Mage Emblem does, it's pitch a card and heal a card with the same name as something that is on your board. Your board. And it's on a two cost as well. Uh, you have to tap, you have to tap, and it's on deploy. You have to tap, but it's, you have to tap and it's on deploy, so it's not spammable, it's not super duper flexible, but it's pretty efficient for what it does. So it's a pretty good card in a green deck. Green deck, but you wouldn't run it in, any, in everything. Both of these cards are very similar in the vein that they vein that they both Yeah, they both exchange something for a card from your orbs. So what this Robin does is you take a bond, you you take a bond, you put it in your orbs, and then you break one of your orbs. I might have the ordering wrong there. Yeah, you destroy your orb first, then you take a card from your bonds put in your orbs. Again, again, I've said this several times over the course of the video, if you have an excess of bonds, you don't mind losing the bond. And since that's the only real cost, is losing a bond, 
If you don't care about losing one face down bond, you essentially just get a free card. And not only do you get a free card from breaking one of your orbs and adding that orb to your hand, and you also get to hand pick a card from your bonds to draw later when you have to take your other orbs. Orbs. So that's pretty good. Uh, she also has a flip one to draw to discard two. It's alright. Uh, then you have Lissa over here, who's flip one, break an to flip one, break an orb of your choice, and then add a copy of your MC from your tree to your orbs. Orbs. So again, it gives you a card in the form of an orb that you feed yourself, but it also enables you to put an MC evade in your orbs for later, which saves you, which can potentially save you a hit later down the line. I think the final healing card we're talking about is, no, it is not. No, it is not. It is definitely not. Uh, Anna, I have alluded to this card before, before when I was talking about 3-2 Mia for about 10 seconds and I said there was a card in green that was better. This card is better. She is a 3-drop that is not a 10 support, support, and her mill is not locked to an on-hit skill. skill. So long as you have another Enna in your hand, you grow for this unit with an Enna from your hand, you proc any skills that proc off of any of your allies' growthing, growthing such as Joffrey, for example. For example, you mill five cards instead of four cards. You mill five cards and pick one of them and add to your hand. And add to your hand. Again, it's pretty efficient, but in effect, it is really only a... In effect, it's really only take an Enna to grab a card that you might want more, and there's no guarantee that card's even going to show up. Going to show up. So it's not perfect, but it's decent. It also has the added benefit of being able to buff another unit by 30 after using the skill. Well, another green unit by 30 after using the skill, anyhow. So anyhow, including herself. So, uh, if you play her and you use her skill, it can be a fairly impactful turn. Impactful turn, but not as impactful as May. Granted, nothing is quite as impactful as May or Liana. So, so it's a pretty... A uh, hard standard to meet in the first place. In the first place. Kerf Naga is a very efficient healer. Kerf Naga is flip one to heal a cost five or higher non Kerf Naga card. I've already said how I feel about flip one for a specific heals. They're very efficient, if not super flexible. Flexible, it's a pretty good card. It's a very good card, actually. Actually, heal a cost 5 is a hell of a lot more flexible than heal a blue flyer ally. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, now I'm going to throw out four purple cards at once. Purple has a lot of MC healers. All four of these cards heal back copies of your MC from the retreat at different costs in different ways. La Rochelle is an attack support. When you proc her, you flip three bonds to heal two copies of your MC, which is expensive and slightly overkill, but is occasionally useful. Nino is probably... Nino and Natasha are the best ones. I'll talk about Nino first. Nino is reveal a card from your hand, place it on top of the deck. That is the cost of the skill, and I'll remind you that you can get value out of using this skill already. Ready? If you do that, you can take a card from the retreat and place it. You can take a copy of your MC from the retreat and place it in your hand. Hand. So it is a put one on top of the deck in order to heal a copy of your MC, and you'll probably get you can probably get value out of whatever you put on the, on the deck anyway. You can stack a Nino on top of the deck and on the deck attack with something, flip one to draw a card. Cards. This is a very flexible way of grabbing back copies of your main character from the retreat. Uh, Chlorine, if she is in the same area as your main character, is a tap clip one to heal main character. It's more efficient than a standard healer. Healer, but suggest that. Slightly more efficient than a standard healer. Than a standard healer. Uh, and then there's Natasha. 
Natasha, who taps, flips to, choose to, heals a copy of your main character, but also stacks a card from the retreat on top of your deck. May I remind you that you can gain value of the card you stack from the retreat on top of the deck, such as Lelina, Lelina, Loot, a Dark Emblem, Fate Emblem, or whatever emblem have you. Uh, the most famous users of Natasha are Al and Lynn. Lynn Lloyd also makes very good use of this card. Riss is a card that no one uses. I think it's worth mentioning because he's mm, probably handy in uh, growth based decks. So, Gawain, it's pretty much Gawain, Ike, Micaiah. None of them use it. <laughs> None of them use it, but if you want a healer, he's there. None of them use it, but if you want a healer, he's there. He's there. He's tapped, flip two. Uh, heal a copy of your uh, heal a copy of your MC, and then also grow for your main character. Main character. So it's not bad. It's not bad. You get two effects for the price of one. It's just very hard to find room in a lot of the green decks that would run this card to run this card. Now we get to t now we get to talk about how to not die a pop pop. So first, I'll just briefly mention this. Uh, it's a flip two to heal. It's a flip two to heal a copy of your a copy of something on the screen on your side of the screen that's not Maribel. Actually, no, you can heal Maribel, Maribel too. Yeah, flip two to heal back something on your side of the screen screen, and she can attack for 60, so if you need to ease up on a lot of pressure, if you need to ease up a lot of pressure, you can deploy this thing, tap your MC to move them back behind this thing so your opponent has to kill this thing, then have this thing kill something on your opponent's side of the screen, while also healing back something, most likely a dodge for your main character, so it's pretty decent in that regard. Now we can talk about... Uh, Jenny's. Now, the final mass search card that I will talk about in this video is the cost one healer. Every color, even black, <laughs> has a cost one healer. Healer. It is a very simple, basic, bare bones way of preventing imminent early game destruction. Destruction. Uh, but it's basic at the expense of it being very relatively expensive. It is tap, flip two, to heal one. Heal one. And I've already gone over far more efficient options in this video, but if you need a cost one option, if you need an early game option, if you need a, or if you need a contingency in case you don't draw something very important, important, you could just search up in skill one, you just go wacky search skill one, heal, or recover, heal or recover, or you could just look up the names of any of the clerics in the fire game. So, you know, Sakura, Elise, Lissa, Mist, uh, whoever the hell genealogy or Theresia's healer was, was, and odds are you will find one of these cards. Cards. Uh, that said, Jenny is staying on this side of the screen for now. Now, uh, I will talk about two cards now that I've rotated out. Uh, Gregor and Hisame do the same thing, just in different colors. When they're destroyed by a regular attack, they're sent to the bond zone. The bond zone. Now, this is impactful for two reasons. First, it's Bond Excel on turn two, which outside of Mannequin Emblem just doesn't exist. <laughs> outside of Dragon Emblem, Mannequin Emblem, and Dragon Blood Emblem, cost two ramp doesn't exist in this game. That I can remember anyway. Remember anyway. So if you're playing blue, other than Mac Emblem, this is your only way of ramping up your bonds. If you're playing white, this is your only way of doing it. Doing it. Unfortunately, again, they're rotated out. So if you're playing in standard format, you cannot play these cards. If you are playing an unlimited game, though, these cards are pretty potent because not only do they bond excel, but if you deploy this card and then tap move back behind this card, say this is your end. Let's say, for hypothetical sake, this is your MC, you tap, move back here, your opponent is forced into a lose situation, 
where they can either leave Gregor alone, therefore leaving your main character alone, alone, allowing whatever frail main character you have, have to survive longer, closer to the point where they start winning the game, or they kill Gregor and give you a bond. It's not a choice they want to make because they lose either way. You win either way. You get something that you want either way. Wait. And the caveat is their 10 supports, and past a certain point, they're, past a certain point in the game, they're just kind of taking up space in your deck. But other than that, they're very good. Gregor is a staple in Tiki, or at least was a staple in Tiki. In Tiki. Uh, did I mention that Haruno's heart is broken, by the way? And by the way, yeah, Haruno's heart's kind of broken into a million tiny pieces from rotation, but that's... That's the point. He'll be okay. He, he'll be okay. He has the blue name after all. So that's these cards. Everything else that I'm going to mention is an orb healer, and the vast majority of them are rotated out. Specifically, Robin over here from set one is rotated out, and Rainbow Robin from set four is also rotated out. Meaning, again, if you're playing a standard format, you cannot play them. So what do they do if you're playing an unlimited format? If you're playing an unlimited format, this card, uh, on deploy, flips two bonds to add the top card of your deck to your orbs, which is decent value because it saves you a hit, and it also gives you another card later. A card that gets added to your orbs is a card that you are eventually going to end up with in your hand when you take those orbs. So you're flipping two to get another card down the line and also save yourself another hit. Love another hit. So that's good. Uh, the caveat is flip two is fairly expensive any flip two is fairly expensive regardless for one. And for another thing, the moment this thing hits to feel it's a dead draw, your opponent could just choose to not kill it, and all it's going to do is sit there at base 50, not hit anything, not kill anything, and not use its skill ever again, as long as your opponent does not kill this thing. Of course, you could always just force your opponent to kill this thing in one way or another. In one way or another, but that will occasionally slow you down. Only occasionally. Rainbow Robin is mostly just here as an anti-discard tech. Our tech, uh, all the skill does is, if your opponent forces you to discard, you can just send this thing and you heal an orb. So it's kind of like a, a gotcha moment. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of those cards exist in this game. That actually reminds me, there's a card that I forgot to put in here. Oh well. Oh well, I'll put in the description if I remember. remember. But this is basically a gotcha card. If your opponent is running a lot of discard, you just say, gotcha bitch, and heal an orb. Which, ironically, just gives them a card later down the line and saves them a hit, which is pretty good. Gunnivar, over here, is pretty much a purple, cost 3, ranged version of Robin 2 that has to tap for her skill. So, a worse Robin 2 with range, basically. basically. And now for the grand finale, we finally made it this far, we're going to talk about arguably the other most broken card in the entire game. I said arguably the most broken card was Mei. Uh, Jenny's a close second. Jenny's a close second. So basically, Jenny has two skills. I've already mentioned the first one, which is flip three. The other one is... The other one is, when you class change into this card, normally, through your deployment phase, that's not using any skills like Chrom 5-4 or Tiki 4 to class change, if you class change into this normally, you just add an orb from your retreat for free. So not only do you get an extra not only do you get an extra orb for an extra hit, you get to choose what's in your orbs, which means you have to choose what ends up in your hand later. Which means if you just put an MC of eight in your orbs, one class change just gets you two dodges for free. Two dodges for free. Or well, two hits. Not necessarily two dodges, but two hits for free. For free. On top of drawing you a card for class changing. Which is really good, by the way. And then there's also the flip three... 
to heal. It's already better than Maria and Alincia, who I had right next to this card, because she does not have to tap for the skill. She can swing on something and use she can swing on something and use the skill in the same turn. She can heal and clear out your base 60, base 50 threats in the back line or in the front line. In the front line. There's also the fact that skill is not once per turn. Turn, which means if you come into this thing and you have six open bonds, you just add four cards to your hand for free. Not for free. You just add four cards to your hand right then and there in one turn. You get to pick all four of them. I like to liken it. I like to liken it to pretty much deciding what the next turn is going to look like ahead of turn. Pretty much deciding what the next two turns are going to look like ahead of turn. Of turn by just handcrafting four of the cards in your hand. The hand. If you use this skill twice in one turn, you can just set up entire combos with cards that are rotated, like with cards that are rotated out, out, and cards that are not rotated out. If you use the skill twice, you can set up. Henry, who's rotated out, by the way. You can set up May. You can set up Delcia, who's going to show up in the next video. There you go. Or you can just grab two dodges and two of something else. Something else in one turn. And finally, there's the fact that if your opponent somehow fails to kill this thing, and you somehow manage to get another copy of this exact card in your hand, if it's still on the board, you can overclass again, add an orb to the top of your deck, to add an, a card from your retreat to your orbs again, and draw a card again. <laughs> again, so this card is pretty, uh... This card is a staple in every control deck. <laughs> if your deck is running ramp, Jenny is probably a good fit for it. If your main character is blue, Jenny is probably a good fit in your deck. <laughs> deck. If your deck, if, if you can classify your deck as a control deck at all, Jenny is a good fit for that deck. That is all I have to say. Um, other than that, hopefully you guys enjoyed hearing me ramble about cards for the past hour and 40 minutes. Hopefully this helps some of you uh, newer players out with finding cards that you can put in your decks or deciding whether or not you want a card in your deck or not. Not if I miss the card, or if someone agrees with my reasoning on a card, feel free to leave a comment there, roasting me on forgetting a card. I can already think of one card I forgot that someone's gonna roast me for if I don't put it in the description. Description. Uh, but anyway, uh, until next time, bye.